Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture and Nova Scotia Sea Farmers Digital Series, Accessing and Retaining Markets for Your Seafood Products. My name is Fred Oikel, and I'm your host and moderator for today's session. For those of you who are perhaps unfamiliar with the Zoom presentations, I have just a few housekeeping items to note. All participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You may also ask a question in the chat function of the webinar. The chat and Q&A will be monitored throughout the session and addressed during the live Q&A session happening at the end of the presentations. I want to acknowledge and thank the digital series presenting sponsors, FCC and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board. Today's digital session, Accessing and Retaining Markets for Your Seafood Products is brought to you by FCC and Perennia. FCC was established in 1959 and is the only lender 100% invested in Canadian food. We only serve the food and beverage industries. FCC has a portfolio of over 36 billion with 96 offices across Canada. We have an expanded mandate to include seafood processing, including FAS trawlers. FCC finances real property, equipment and inventory, expansion and construction, stretch debt and cash flow requirements, mergers and acquisitions, syndicated lending, and we have access to venture capital. From startup to mature, large, small to large, we are with our customers through the life cycle of their business. I will now play a small or short video from Perennia outlining and illustrating the vast and specialized services that they offer. At Perinia, our focus is on helping Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood, and food and beverage sectors overcome industry challenges, access new markets, and develop new products. It is our mission to support the growth, transformation, and economic development of these industries. Our comprehensive team of specialists have a wide variety of skills and a deep understanding and knowledge of their focus areas. Our agriculture specialists have expertise covering horticulture, livestock, plant pathology, field crops, and soils. Our seafood specialists have experience in successfully leading complex development projects and facilitating partnerships. Our food scientists have expertise in a variety of areas, including process development, process troubleshooting, value-added product development, food packaging solution, and product commercialization. Our quality and food safety specialists can support you in ensuring the safety and quality of your products. Our analytical team has expertise in chemistry and microbiology in many areas, including cannabis analysis. Your goals are our goals. We will work with you to achieve your business goals and help your company grow. Learn more about Perinia by visiting www.perinia.ca. As mentioned earlier, my name is Fred Oikel and I'm pleased to be your host and moderator for this session. I'm a Senior Relationship Manager for Commercial Financing with FCC, responsible for Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. I would now like to introduce you to our panelists for today's session. Denise Gershon, Global Aquaculture Association, Pam Laffin, Perennia, Jennifer Wiper, Cook Aquaculture, and John Sackton, Seafood Data Search. As noted, this is the first of a series of digital sessions, and I would invite you to participate in the upcoming sessions. Further details of these sessions can be found on the Perennia website. And now to start the formal part of today's session, I would like to introduce our first and keynote speaker, John Sackton of Seafood Data Search. At the end of his presentation, John will be available to address any questions from the Q&A tab. John Sackton has worked in the seafood industry for more than 40 years as a writer, editor, speaker, consultant, market analyst, price arbitrator, project manager, and seafood importer. He is president of Seafood Data Search and founder of Seafood News, the most widely read daily seafood industry trade publication in North America. He does extensive market research, consulting, and price arbitration for fisheries in North America, Europe, and Asia. Sackton has a particular focus on crab, lobster, shrimp, oysters, mussels, and whitefish. After retiring as publisher, he continues to write his winding glass column for Seafood News. 
In addition to his 20 years in the news business, Sackton has maintained an active role speaking and consulting on seafood industry issues. His major consulting clients on a multi-year basis include the lobster, crab, and shrimp industry in Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Alaska, and Oregon. He has also done work on cod, other ground fish, oysters and mussels, catfish, salmon, Russian crab, and U.S. seafood markets for more than 100 international corporate and government clients during the past 23 years. In 2012, he co-founded the annual Global Seafood Market Conference, which became the U.S. National Fisheries Institute premier annual meeting. Sackton organized the market panels, prov panels providing details outlook for shrimp, crab, lobster, ground fish, mollusks, scallops, salmon, and specialty species. He is a graduate of Harvard College and has a master's degree in marine affairs from the University of Rhode Island. He lives with his wife in Lexington, Massachusetts, near his three children and three grandchildren. Please welcome John Sackton. Um, thank you, Fred. That's a very uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in a second, and we're going to go through the slide presentation. Um, but because I go through the slides kind of quickly, uh, I'm also providing in the chat uh, a link to download the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to now uh, share my screen screen. OK, there we go. Uh, that's good. OK, good morning. So what we're going to talk about today is issues for Nova Scotia seafood markets in 2021. And we're particularly going to go through uh, the impact of the pandemic on seafood and the changes in seafood marketing and consumption that that's brought about and some of the ramifications uh, for some of the different uh, major seafood products in Nova Scotia. Um, I won't go into this background as Fred has given me a very uh, kind introduction. So what we want to cover for today in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is we want to do an overview of the pandemic impact on the food industry and particularly seafood industry. Uh, we want to talk about the new food purchase patterns that are in the US and in China and Europe as well. We want to talk about what some of the disruptive factors are in seafood production and shipping and changes that we've observed in trade flows uh, over the last uh, uh, 12 months uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, then we want to talk about marketing opportunities in a post-COVID environment. And then the last half of the presentation, we'll get into some very specific uh, market outlooks for the primary uh, export seafood species out of Nova Scotia. So one year into the pandemic, what have we learned? First of all, last April and May, particularly in April, we were very concerned about whether we'd even have a season in Atlantic Canada on uh, lobster and uh, snow crab in particular. Uh, there was a sharp drop in price and output on both these species. But since then, we've seen major changes in food consumption patterns and the impact of uh, stimulus and government relief money and that's led to actually a higher overall seafood sale in 2020 than in 2019. And certain products like snow crab, for example, have had absolute record phenomenal years uh, this past year, which was not something that we foresaw at all uh, last April. Uh, the recovery in 2021 is gonna depend on continued economic stimulus which hope is going to be forthcoming. So if we look from a export perspective for Nova Scotia exporters, uh, I think it's fair to say they had a better year than expected. Uh, lobster landing volume, lobster volume has been down. This was primarily due, I think, to lower landings. Uh, there's also been some weather issues uh, related to LFA 34 openings in December, a lack of fishing days. But you'll notice the average price was only down by 3%. And so if we look here, we saw a big price drop in the value of lobster exports during the pandemic, starting out in February to China and then continuing. But since then, we've seen a, a significant recovery. And uh, that recovery has allowed us to have uh, what are quite uh, normal lobster prices right now, uh, even though uh, they're reflecting a very 
very weak volume. The most important thing that's happened is there's been a structural change in both trade patterns and seafood markets. And I think this is going to persist. It's not going to just disappear in 2021. There, of course, will be some movement back to food service, but uh, this is not a transient phenomenon. So if we look at 2019, you can see seafood sales were, uh, this is in, in uh, uh, billions of dollars, by the way, but you can look at seafood sales being about equally divided between retail and food service. If you look at 2020, we see 64% uh, go to retail and only 36% go to food service. This has been a huge, huge change market. Um, because of that, seafood sales actually grew because the industry had a net growth of 7%. And that was because the uh, uh, growth in, in grocery and retail sales of seafood surpassed by a significant margin what was lost in the closure of restaurants and, and food service. And Nova Scotia species have benefited especially from this new retail demand. So if we look at the top species in retail seafood, in other words, what species increased their sales the most over prior years, we can see that crab was up 87%, lobster was up 87%, scallops were up 64%, and halibut, another important Atlantic, Canadian, and Nova Scotia species, halibut was up 52%. So what we've seen here is really strong demand for these products that are produced in Atlantic Canada. Um, the industry got a reprieve from retail seafood. Uh, in other words, we were very concerned in the spring as to what was gonna happen. And the fact that the retail demand kicked in especially in, in, in June, May and June, it kicked in and that really changed things in our approach uh, very, uh, very quickly. Uh, the other thing that happened, which was a real key uh, driver of this is the strength of frozen. Uh, the frozen category outperformed every other part of retail for seafood and for frozen food in general. So that, uh, frozen seafood outperformed fresh, it outperformed sort of shelf stable seafood. And what we found was there was, a, together with the consumers uh, going into the retail stores for their food purchases, there was also a much bigger uh, uh, acceptance of frozen food. In other words, people wanted to stock up and they weren't anymore insisting that whatever fresh fish they got had to be bought that day and cooked that night. Instead, they would go into the retail stores and buy frozen seafood and plan to eat it over a, a week or, or two weeks. And this is really, really important behavior. And I think it's uh, something that's gonna stick. I, I, I think that the uh, differential or sort of I, consumer idea between fresh and frozen seafood has really changed uh, as a result of the pandemic. You can see here, this is uh, five-year trends for the three categories. You can see that frozen had already been on somewhat of an upward trend, uh, whereas retail uh, was up last year, but it was sort of flat if you look at it over four or five years, but you can see a gradual upward trend in frozen and then this big jump. And of course, uh, shelf stable also benefited uh, from, from that trend. Um, so crab and lobster, uh, actually we think of live lobster, we think of lobster from Nova Scotia, which is also sold primarily live. live. So we pay attention to the live lobster trade, but the powerhouse of lobster at retail was really driven by frozen lobster. It wasn't simply an expansion of live trade, it was expansion of frozen tails and meat and allowed the processors uh, in, who are primarily in, in New Brunswick and, and PEI to buy a greater share of live lobster. And that in turn improved the live lobster price. And crab uh, already is a frozen item. Uh, and so that was uh, moving right into the wheelhouse of crab in terms of its uh, consumer appeal.
So also we've identified some trends, several people have identified different trends helping seafood consumption. Uh, first of all, there's a big increase in home cooking and people were no longer afraid to cook seafood. There was a big increase in the use of frozen food. And also I think very importantly, there was a continued emphasis on health during the pandemic and seafood definitely benefited from people's interest in healthy eating and eating more healthy products. But as we know, the pandemic has hit uh, these sectors, uh, different sectors very unevenly. And if we look at food service, which was the other major leg of seafood sales, uh, food service seafood dollar sales were down about 70%. And the shutdown of the sector has had a huge impact uh, uh, we began to see some recovery in the summer as there was a, a, a low point in the pandemic uh, uh, level of infection, but then we lost ground again in the fall and particularly uh, in December and January, as we've seen, at least in, in the US, a, a very high peak in, in terms of uh, infections. I mean, now it's coming down, but what happened at that time was it, it, it led to more restaurant closures. It reinforced the idea among consumers it's not safe to eat in restaurants. And so whatever gains that the food service had made during the summer kind of evaporated in, in, in December and January. So if we look at within the food service sector, casual and fine dining restaurants have been hit harder than uh, fast, casual, quick service restaurants, mid-scale restaurants. So you can see that the total closures have been, have been greatest in casual and fine dining. Uh, some of these are temporary, uh, but a, a large number of them is, is permanent, uh, are expected to be permanently closed. If we also look at takeout, because a lot of restaurants move to do takeout, and some of the most successful seafood items were items that were adaptable to a restaurant takeout, uh, like a, a lobster roll, for example. But what we can see is that in these categories here, there is no chance uh, that they could make up their income from takeout. Uh, what this shows is that uh, in fine dining, family dining, for example, uh, only, uh, 12% of restaurants were able to maintain 50% of their sales through takeout. Same thing in casual dining. In, in fine dining, it was only like 4%. And just on a, on a personal level, I mean, we try to support some of our better local restaurants. And so uh, they've been doing innovation, like they make meals to cook at home, uh, which we'll buy from, from what used to be some of our favorite restaurants. Sometimes they'll have special takeout orders but even so, that is not making up for the, uh, for the sales volume that, that they've lost. So the National Restaurant Association in the US does uh, surveys about sentiment and so forth. And you can see that the outlook uh, for sales uh, sentiment has been increasing, but the report of revenues on same store sales has been decreasing. And so here you can see a little bit of a bump up in the summer and then falling back again uh, in, in the fall. Uh, this is the proportion of purple that has higher same store sales. And this is the proportion up here that has lower same store sales. So in December, 80% of all restaurants were seeing lower revenue, uh, which rivals 83% uh, in May during the height of the, uh, just after the height of the close down in the pandemic. Uh, we also have an uh, open table, which is tracking restaurant traffic in multiple countries. And so they're doing a daily chart of seated, uh, seated restaurant diners. And we have uh, four countries here. Um, we can, let's start with Canada and the US. This is, uh, this is a 12 month rolling uh, chart. So this is really February of, uh, end of February of 2020. So we can see the crash, whoops, let me go back here. Uh, there we are. You can see the crash uh, in restaurants as the closures took effect. 
Then a gradual increase in the, in the US and Canada. Uh, for a while there, Canada was doing better than the US, but then that reversed course in both countries. And since then, we've had <coughs> continued close downs. And in fact, uh, Canada and Toronto and, and Montreal and places like that have had much more uh, restaurant closures than, than we've been experiencing in the, in the US in the last couple of months. If you look at uh, Germany and the UK, uh, Germany uh, was somewhat successful this summer. Then they hit a new period of lockdowns, which is still in place. Uh, the UK tried to open up in the summer and they've come back into another period of lockdowns as well. So the basic takeaway here is that restaurant traffic has not recovered. Um, we think the overall recovery of the restaurant industry is gonna be quite slow. Uh, restaurants have been pairing their menus. Uh, the worst hit items are items like oysters that didn't have a huge uh, retail uptake, but depended on oyster bars and, and sort of being served a, a shucked oyster on the half shell. Uh, and so those type of items have really suffered most in terms of the seafood sector. Uh, but as the restaurant industry recovers, we think that's gonna add to retail demand, not substitute for it. And so that's why we think that there's a, a very strong outlook on pricing for a lot of, a lot of seafood items in this coming, uh, coming year because we think the demand is going to be additive. <clears throat> so I think that the outlook for a strong seafood export performance has improved. Um, there's uh, some, some potential signs that the ramped up vaccine distribution in the US, which is the most important market for Canada, may lead to a strong economic recovery that might be visible by summer. And this is going to result in increased seafood demand uh, at food service as some of these companies start buying back. And the maintenance, the whole strategy of the Federal Reserve and the Biden administration is to avoid what happened in 2008, 2009. If we go back to that time in the lobster industry, it took years for lobster prices to recover. And the reason was that there was a big drag in terms of people's income and employment and so forth that, and housing costs that continued many years after the, after the initial crash. Well, this year, the strategy on all of the uh, federal government in the US is to not have that happen. They really wanna bounce people's incomes right up as high as they can by the end of this year. And so that's why we're seeing this pass through that we expect to uh, see in terms of seafood demand and uh, it would lead to upward, upward price pressure. So now uh, let's turn uh, to trade flows uh, and then we're gonna talk about specific species. So if we look at uh, Canada's trade with the US, China and Europe in 2020, uh, this is, is, is what we're showing. And I, I highlighted 2020 in the thick lines. So for the US, we've actually seen a, a, a large recovery in terms of China's, in terms of Canadian seafood shipments, sorry, uh, Canadian seafood shipments to the US where we, since June, we've been running at a level that's been above what we've had in prior years. But if we look at China, uh, we have not been running at a level that's above prior years. We've been consistently running at a level that's lower than prior years. And we'll get into that. We look at Europe, Europe is kind of about the same. And in fact, uh, trade sales to Europe are about the same as they were uh, in 2020 as in 2019. So let's look at Canadian live lobster exports to China. So this is where we really ran into a problem. Remember, China was the first company that was hit by the, a country hit by the pandemic. So we had a sharp drop in February as China shut down and a very, very slow recovery. We had a little bit more of a recovery in the summer and then we dropped again. Now, fourth quarter exports from, from uh, live lobster, which is largely Nova Scotia lobster to China was down 32% compared to the prior year. Part of this was lower volumes and part of this was pricing. But something very interesting has happened in China. 
Uh, the US has increased their lobster sales to China, not only a little bit, but it increased substantially by over 50% uh, for the year. And so you can see here uh, the graph of the takeoff in US live lobster sales to China. So what happened here? Well, the tariff that had been in place got removed. So the pricing of the US lobster in China became much more competitive. And if you look at these months, these August, September, October months, where is the North American lobster being produced? It's being produced in Maine. It's not being produced as much in Canada. So the Chinese who were buying live lobster turned to their US suppliers. And if you look at this second graph here is total Chinese lobster volume. So what we see here is that after June, total lobster volume for China has increased. It was just that the Canadian share of that lobster uh, did not increase. And so when you look at those Canadian lower level exports to China, it's not telling the whole story. What we've seen here is a snapback Back in 2017, before the US trade war to China, the US and Canadian lobster exports to that market were about 50-50. In other words, the US was close to supplying 50% of the live China market. Uh, I don't think they're back at that level, but they've definitely made something in that direction. And so the Canadians who were supplying 75% of that lobster market in 2019, this year in 2020 are supplying less than 75%. Um, this just shows the price premium. Uh, US is getting a price premium over Canadian lobster to China. And here's where we had the tariff. And as the tariff was removed, it narrowed. Uh, what's the reason for the price premium? Um, I'm gonna be very quick here, but I think that part of it is that the US sales to China are more graded than the Canadian sales. You have Canadian companies who are basically for price pressures, competitive pressures, buying ocean run lobster and shipping them to China and accepting a high dead loss because their Chinese partners will pay, uh, want, want the lower price and will take the dead loss in return for that lower price. Whereas the US has a slightly different structure and the companies that are shipping lobster to China are not willing to tolerate uh, any kind of level of dead loss. And I think that that is what is potentially being reflected in these different pricing. Uh, that's just my theory. If we look at cold water shrimp, China is a very important market for cold water shrimp. This is shell on cold water shrimp uh, produced uh, mostly in offshore factory vessels. Uh, you can see how much the exports have declined in the fourth quarter. Uh, and if we look at China's economic growth, the interesting thing here is that China's economic growth has definitely recovered. This is, this is where we were in 2020. And they're gonna be one of the few countries that is positive for the entire year. But if you look at their growth by industry, wholesale and retail and accommodation and dining, where, where all the food sales are, is the lagging indicator in China. So even though we're seeing a Chinese economic recovery, it's not being translated into uh, strong demand for imported food, not just yet. So there's a lot of exporter headwinds when we talk about China. Uh, China has is, is, found some COVID uh, uh, DNA traces on frozen seafood packaging, and the Chinese media has been all over that. And it's literally made Chinese consumers afraid to buy foreign imported seafood, especially frozen imported seafood. Uh, it's also increased the inspection and the uh, risk for importers because if they bring in a container and one box on that container has a bad test and has a COVID sample, let's say somebody was packing it in a plant, uh, they reject the entire container and the importer loses money. So the exports to China are continually gonna have headwinds. So if we want to just summarize the lobster trade, during the period uh, for July, December, the U.S. produced more live lobster than Canada. The removal of the tariff allowed U.S. exporters to target former customers. Air cargo options, I think, also favored the U.S. in the summer. You don't have the same number of charter flights. 
out of Halifax and, and Moncton that you do in the Canadian seasons. Uh, there were fewer discounts on U.S. lobster. And in general, I think the 2021 Chinese New Year did not meet expectations. Remember, China uh, clamped down on travel and they encouraged people to stay home during the Chinese New Year. So what about Europe? So we want to take a look at Europe and we look at a few, uh, few uh, Nova Scotia species. If we look at um, Canadian frozen scallops to France, this is a positive story. Our, our 2020 volume is up uh, nearly 20%. But this was because the overall volume of scallops to France fell. In other words, they were getting less scallops from Peru, less from China, less from other sources. And that's one of the reasons why we see this increase in, in shipments from Nova Scotia. Whoops. Uh, sorry, let me go back to where we are. Um, uh, if we look at lobster to Europe, uh, we do not see the same pattern that we saw in China. Canadian lobsters to Europe are a little bit up, but US live lobster to Europe is down uh, by 50% or more. And the total is down 10% or so. So the Europeans are not buying lobster in the same way that the Chinese are. If we look at cold water shrimp, uh, we're seeing uh, 2020 being, since June, sort of being on a par uh, as uh, Europe with all, all sources. But if we look at Canadian cold water shrimp, we're seeing the volumes are a little bit down. Uh, Canadian production, of course, is flat. We're not seeing any major increases in Canadian production. Um, if we look at the UK, trying to get a feel for what's happening, uh, we had the same pattern in the UK of retail seafood increasing uh, over food service during the lockdowns, of course. And you can see it was not the same extent as in, in the US. So we've had, uh, you know, we don't see 60, 80% increases in frozen seafood item sales at UK retail. We see healthy increases, but they're in the uh, five to 20% range. Um, Carrefour, which is one of the major supermarket chains in France and Spain and has uh, subsidiaries in the rest of Europe, uh, they reported huge uh, sales gains uh, in food in France and so forth. And this was a, a sign that some of the same uh, factors that were influencing retail sales in the US have influenced retail sales in Europe. Um, what we found is that there's been a movement in food purchases to lower density areas. Uh, this is just the US with the highest density postal codes versus the lowest density. Uh, and you can see the dollar share of the lower density ones has increased. Uh, we've seen the same thing in Europe. And what this is showing us is that the fact that people are working from home has changed the food where they buy their food. And the center city stores are not getting the same traffic and the, and the more dense areas where there's a lot of office development and so forth are not getting the same traffic. So people are buying food in more dispersed areas. Uh, it's also led to much further adoption of online sales and increased focus on neighborhood and small format stores. If you don't want to risk going into a big supermarket, you're more likely to stop into a neighborhood store. And these things seem to be true across both North America and Europe. Uh, we think the European recovery is slower than the US and China. Uh, I think that that's because the vaccine rollout there has not been as great. Um, we also want to talk about uh, some issues with cargo and air freight. Uh, air cargo has recovered. We had a big issues of, of lack of volume, but now air cargo volume is expected to reach pre-pandemic levels. The reason is because of charters. It's not because of passenger craft. It's because there's a lot of online commerce that's demanding air freight, and that's leading more charter companies to add aircraft. Average rates rose substantially in December. Uh, that's, that's also having an impact on seafood. Um, sea freight disruptions are potentially quite significant. Uh, there's a massive backup and, and snafu with containers. In some ports, what used to take seven days to get a container loaded 
It's now taking 30 to 60 days. So the freight rates from China, Asia to Europe and the US have shot up as, as this congestion has not uh, been worked through yet. And that's going to affect, for example, the availability of things like warm water shrimp in the US. So in, before we get to our species um, summary, let's just uh, show where we are. Seafood has met the moment in 2020. 33% more of US adults bought seafood, uh, up from 25% in 2019. If you do the math, that's like a 25% increase in the number of consumers. That is huge. 44% bought seafood online, up from 19% in 2019. Uh, so the factors that we're doing, we, we talked about eating healthier. That's been the major driver. Also, the desire for variety and diet as people are cooking at home, the idea of healthy protein and the fact of, of more cooking at home. All of these things are seafood attributes that are going to maintain themselves into the future. So it's really a, a very positive story about the value of seafood. There are some opportunities here. Uh, one of the biggest issues in the pandemic brought out the mismatch of packaging, that people did not have the packaging needed for retailers when the retailers were having labor problems. So uh, there was a big movement to smaller unit packaging for retail sales and for food service packaging that can go direct to the consumer online. And to the extent that people can make, uh, seafood producers can make innovations in the packaging area, that has a lot of potential. Uh, the other thing is education of consumers. People were afraid that consumers didn't want to cook seafood, but in fact they did. So there are tremendous opportunities for uh, seafood education and for getting people to try, try more products. And finally, retailers are nervous about these high prices. Uh, we, we suppliers are going to have to work with them to show that the products have retail value whether that means smaller portions, whether that means direct to consumer packaging. Um, and on food service, they've drastically cut the range of seafood menu items. So it's gonna be much harder to get a more marginal item, like let's say a redfish onto a restaurant menu. And so the focus has to be, how do we make our Canadian redfish attractive to consumers at retail? We need to demonstrate to a food service guy why they should put a product on the menu when they're trying to limit, limit, limit menu choices. So I think the vaccine rollout is gonna drive trade flows. We have to pay attention to countries that are lagging in vaccine distribution because that's gonna slow any economic growth. So now in the next um, uh, 10 minutes or so, I wanna go very quickly through some species, uh, uh, specific species things. Uh, I did uh, put the chat, put this whole presentation in the chat. So if I skip over some slides, uh, you can always uh, download that and, and, and look, look at it uh, in the future. Uh, we're seeing really high demand for lobster right now. And the basic story of that is that demand has recovered, but supplies have been lower than expected. And so that's driving a, a really high spring shore price right now. It's also driven higher prices for frozen lobster and lobster tail and lobster meat. So if you look, you can see this drop off in supply in the US. If you look at uh, US supply of lobster and the, uh, the blue here is um, uh, US uh, lobster meat, US landings, Canadian imports. You can see the Canadian imports fell from 50 million to 46 million pounds. US landings fell from 130, 128 million. So we're seeing a drop there and that's what's giving it price support. Here's the live lobster pricing. Uh, after our experience of the pandemic, we very quickly got into a normal price range. And what we're seeing this year is a seasonal peak uh, based on total lack of supply and buying for China, which is still continuing uh, to get uh, some export market demand there. So there's a lot of demand for the lobsters that are available. Uh, if we, I just love this chart because you can see how clearly the live lobster pricing, the low for the year is always in June. 
And you can see that it has very little relationship, direct relationship to the price of tails of meat. But what's important here is the recovery in the price of tails and meat. And that led, led processors to increase their purchase of live lobster uh, in July, August, September, and into the fall. And that's what's helped support that recovery in price. It wasn't just more sales of live lobster. It was sales of processed lobster where people needed the product to go into their plants. Um, Lobster and crab are mostly eaten in restaurants, as we know. And so the fact that we saw these big gains in the shift to retail is very significant. It means that people are willing to take these products and, and eat them at home. Um, this is Frozen Tails. This is Winn-Dixie, a, a retailer in Florida. And if you look at how much they've increased their promotion on frozen lobster tail, up 65%. So even though the prices are high, the rest the food service, the retailers have been promoting this and that's what's driven the change in, um, in, in usage. So <clears throat> we've talked about how the pandemic's impacted live lobster volume buying. One of the other things I wanna point out is tourism. Uh, there is very un much uncertainty about the tourism uh, season in Maine and, and New England and the East Coast. And it turned out to be very strong because apparently uh, in the summer there was lower rate of infection and there was no international travel. And so there was a big surge in rental units and people taking local vacations, driving vacations. And that supported a very healthy demand in the shore-based tourist areas for both crab and, and lobster. China still remains a wild card. Uh, we've seen a uh, continued increase in China, as I said before, a healthy Chinese market in 2021, uh, particularly if there's more recovery in the food sector, could add to uh, upward positive pressure on, on lobster prices. So live prices are seasonal highs. Uh, if retail demand continues, we expect the processors to buy strongly this spring for frozen lobster. Uh, US lobster is more competitive with, with Canadian lobster in both China and Europe. Um, and we do risk the fact that high prices could curtail retail promotion. But overall, I think we're looking at a very positive year for 2021. Uh, snow crab, <coughs> US on track for the highest volume market in 10 years. And Russian snow crab has significantly begun to compete with Canada. Uh, snow crab performed better than almost any other seafood commodity because the price was set right when we didn't know what the hell was happening with the pandemic, but it was set correctly in my view and very quickly returned to normal levels once buyers gained confidence uh, that, uh, that they could do so. And so we see a big increase in, in snow crab imports into the U.S. And you can look at, uh, in, let's find that chart again. Look at June compared to 2019. Look at July compared to 2019, August. You know, these months saw surging imports once the market recognized that uh, snow crab was really gonna be healthy. Uh, Russia, Norway now account for 33% of US imports. That's becoming an increasing factor especially as Canadian landings are not necessarily increasing year by year. I, I think the Russian uh, snow crab is here to stay in the US market. And the US is drastically incre increasing its global share of snow crab market over Japan. Uh, that's because the US market is paying these higher prices. Whereas in Japan, a lot of the snow crab has been used as, as crab meat with sushi. And when you go to like a reprocessing, the expense of that is so high, it's wiped out entire segments of the Japanese snow crab market, uh, the conveyor belt sushi and things like that, that can no longer afford to put uh, snow crab on, onto their menus. So that's shifted the Japanese demand to raw crab, which has become a very important product. Um, and, as we've seen, the snow crab price is being driven by their increase in retail demand. This was the opening price in 2020. This is the current price. 
And what we've seen is this opening price gave buyers confidence that they could see what the market was going to do with that crab. If this opening price had been higher, we could have had a, a, a much more cautious market reaction. Right now, the US market is undersupplied with snow crab. There's almost, there's no inventory. Uh, Alaska is going to increase slightly, uh, but the Japanese are now buying more crab out of Alaska. So uh, we think there's going to be less, less, probably strong opening prices on snow crab this coming year. And we're going to have to see how the negotiations that start the season play out. But there is a concern that the price must meet retailers' expectations. The reason they bought all this crab last year was because it worked in their stores. And if the price gets too high, remember, most of that retail inventory is priced considerably lower than the current spot prices today. So when we look at pricing for 2021, we have to look at what is the average price for the retail inventory? Well, it certainly will go up but it can't go up to the spot market or the retailers will rebel. Uh, cold water shrimp, I'll just rush through this. Uh, cooked and peeled market was weak before the pandemic. Um, fro frozen seafood has been more stable in terms of price than fresh halibut, but uh, you can see that uh, than fresh markets, but pandalus has been declining. You can see the value and volume of, of Canadian cold water shrimp is declining. Uh, this is um, European volume uh, is down a little bit. China volume is down a little bit. U.S. prices have come down on, on cold water shrimp. This is not a product that has benefited uh, from the pandemic uh, because people are already used to shrimp and, and retail shrimp is not one of the items that they've gotten some bump that they have not been as spectacular as things like crab and lobster. Uh, and cold water shrimp also much more dependent on food service, uh, hit in the food service sales in the UK, for example, the sandwich makers and people like that are not selling as much. And we also see that uh, shrimp production is stabilizing uh, now so that uh, the market is like well supplied. So you can see, this is our estimate of global Pendalis production. Uh, US shrimp market, up substantially over four years, but uh, the, there's now a lot of concern about inventories in the, shrimp, in the shrimp market in the US. And although sales volume has been spectacular, the, uh, and the volume of imports has been sp spectacular, the average price of shrimp has been declining a lot. And currently what's supporting the sales volume is the lower pricing of shrimp. And I think this is bleeding over into cold water shrimp market as well. And so we don't have any expectation for a change in this pattern in 2021. Another Nova Scotia species, halibut, a great success story. 11% increase in volume in 2020 with only a 1% increase in value. That shows healthy demand. Atlantic halibut has become very competitive uh, with Alaskan and, and Pacific halibut, especially on the East Coast. Uh, we did see this is halibut pricing. Uh, the black line is, is frozen Alaska halibut out of Seattle. Red line is, is fresh uh, Canadian halibut. And what we can see here is that, yes, we did have a period of lower prices uh, once the pandemic started, but then we've seen the recovery. And now you can compare these, these years. We're sort of in a, in a similar situation as to where we were in 2019. Uh, scallops had the same issue, uh, weakening during the first few months after the pandemic and then recovering. Uh, same thing with Canadian IQF. Uh, less scallops from China. Uh, this has uh, started a, again, scallops have participated in this retail boom that's led to stronger demand and, and higher pricing. The US has spaced out their landings a little bit more than they have in prior years. So our supply of fresh scallops is a little bit lower overall. That's also supporting the price. Uh, oysters, um, the problem with oysters is that oysters are more dependent on food service. So if you look at farmed oyster volume to the US, this is down 44%, but the price has been about the same. This is because the oyster growers can't sell their 
their product at anything less than that. In fact, in the US, there have even been conservation groups that have stepped in to buy oysters that couldn't be sold at the farm and use them to replenish um, uh, natural oyster reefs. Uh, so the oyster industry is still, I think, quite depressed and is gonna be slow to recover. So to give a summary, we've seen major changes in seafood consumption. I think they're likely to endure. Uh, we've seen many species have increased in price and volume because seafood has some very favorable trends in terms of consumption. Uh, high prices make the overall situation a little bit unstable. We're very dependent on the retailers seeing seafood as a promotable item. Consumers, when they start going out to eat and to go to hockey games and baseball games, they may change their perception. A $20 frozen lobster meat looks okay when you have nothing else to do and nothing else to spend your money on. But if you're looking at uh, baseball tickets or you're looking at going out to an entertainment venue or a bar or a restaurant, all of a sudden that $20 price might appear different. And that is the thing we have to watch for in the trade off of spending on these high priced items. So that's a quick summary. Uh, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions before we go on to our next uh, panelists. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can come back uh, online. Thank you, John. Uh, we do have a few questions here. And um... I will uh, I'll read them as they in the order that they came in. So if the loss of the cruise ship demand for prepared lobster wasn't that big, particularly in PEI. So I uh, well, what happened with prepared lobster, both frozen tails and meat, the, the, the cruise ships had a hell of a problem. I mean, the cruise ships are using a three ounce tail and you could find three ounce tails at hugely, hugely discounted prices. But that extra sort of oversupply in Florida only lasted a couple of months because the retailers then took that up. And once the retail, you saw the Winn-Dixie promotion on lobster tail. So one, once the retailers started to promote both lobster meat and lobster tail, it absorbed all of the supply. And so what we've seen since then is that we've seen an increase in the market price of both tails and meat pretty pretty steadily since July or August. And that's largely due not, the, the cruise ships have gone away, yes they have, but they've been more than replaced by the retail who, for the reason I just mentioned about entertainment sales and so forth, uh, people seem willing to buy a lobster tail for certain kind of occasions at home. And that's what's uh, led that demand. Okay, thank you. How will the tariff that was removed from the U.S. lobster impact the sale of Nova Scotia seafood, particularly lobster to China? Will China's demand for Nova Scotia seafood decrease? And what can Nova Scotia do to remain competitive? The most important thing to remain competitive is to focus on lobster quality, in my opinion. There are a lot of poor quality lobsters being shipped to China, and some of them are coming out of Nova Scotia. And that, that is depressing the price across the entire market. Now, in terms of competitiveness, remember a few years ago, we were at a 50-50 live lobster market in China from the US and from Canada. And there was a lot more, you know, a lot of companies have operations on both sides of the border. Um, with the tariff, those companies that had operations on both sides of the border were forced to use only their Canadian operations to ship to their customers in China. With the removal of tariff, uh, companies can use uh, all, their, all their facilities, whether they're in Atlantic Canada or in, the US or in New England, uh, to fulfill the demand for these same customers. And so we're seeing uh, basically the US get its foot back in the door in China. And I don't, you know, I don't think we're going back to a 50-50, but I think we're going back to 70-30 uh, or, or 65, 35, something like that. And I think it really depends on the Chinese demand. If the Chinese demand is, is strong, it's gonna suck up lobster from both countries and help maintain the price. But if the Chinese demand is weaker, either because 
people are, are buying less uh, seafood online or they move to something else or, or whatever, or they have uh, fears about imported seafood, then we're gonna see a repercussion in the market. And this New Year's, we did see some repercussions in the market. It was not as strong as it could have been. A lot of these US lobster sales for China took place not just prior to New Year, but in the prior months as the Chinese who didn't get Canadian lobsters in the spring tried to make up uh, for some of that when the Canadian seasons were closed. So yeah, the US lobster is back, it's gonna be competitive. And I, I think quality is the outstanding issue. Great, thank you. We have one, I think we have one time for one last question here. And hi, John, as you point out, the oyster industry was hit hard given that it sells almost exclusively, exclusively to food service. Do you see retail as a viable option for the oyster industry as an opportunity to diversify? This would seem a challenge given its price point and consumption complexity. Any other diversification options for this species? Uh, that is a really uh, good question. And I mean, you know, one of the New Brunswick companies, uh, Beausoleil started to do a little retail pack of a dozen oysters in a little box. And I thought it was a great product, uh, but it didn't last because the only people who would buy it are people who were comfortable shucking oysters themselves. And that's been the, the bottleneck here, which is people go to the restaurants and bars because they can eat, get the shucked oysters that they can't do on their own. So I think that when we think about future oyster products and diversification, um, in the U.S. market, there's an awful lot of Southern oysters that are sold as shucked product. And that's a very hard price point to meet with a farmed oyster. But I'm wondering if there might not be some kind of premium uh, shucked oyster products. Uh, there are some out of Chesapeake Bay, for example, where they do have a small a traditional market for shucked oysters that, that's used at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so I'm wondering if some sort of uh, premium shucked oyster product might be uh, a viable way to go, but, but the price point on that is gonna be uh, very difficult uh, to hit. Uh, but other than that, and, and finding some new markets uh, in Europe or, or export markets, uh, it, it's a very hard nut to crack. Great. Thank you, John. Thanks for that engaging um, uh, presentation. I appreciate you joining us today. Um, for our next series of speakers, we will have the question and answer period after all three have concluded their presentations. And I do encourage you to continue to use the Q&A tab to pose your questions. And John has committed to stay for the duration. So if someone does have a question for John towards the end of uh, our session today, he would be more than happy to address it at that time. Our next panelist is Pam Laffin from Perennia. Pam is here to give us an overview of the Global Food Safety Initiative process and benefits. Pam has over 30 years of experience in food manufacturing industry. After graduating with a diploma in quality food control technology, she has, she has worked in various commodities, including anything from dairy to snack foods. Pam is familiar with a multitude of acts, regulations, and standards. Throughout her career, she has filled roles in a range of different departments, such as quality assurance and product development. She has also completed extensive training in HACCP, BRCGS, SQF, internal auditing, shelf life determination and grading for mink and fish products. As part of Perennia's quality and food safety team, Pam assists clients across Canada, across Atlantic Canada that is, in reaching their quality and food safety goals. This includes helping clients develop, implement and maintain federal and provincial regulatory requirements and GFSI certifications such as BRCGS. Pam has been a mentor and a trainer for peers and colleagues as well as serving as a technical liaison for industry. I'll now pass control over to Pam. Thank you, Fred. I will just try to share my screen. There. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fred. It is great to be here in this year's Minister's Digital Series. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, GFSI which is 
Global Food Safety Initiative or GFSI certification are customer driven uh, food safety programs that are becoming more popular, especially among the seafood industry. They are required to um, access new markets. GFSI is a private organization that benchmarks and approves different auditing schemes such as uh, BRCGS, uh, SQF. So some of these benefits of having this certification are accessing new markets, helps companies stay competitive. These certification audits are like having a fresh set of eyes review your food safety system, allowing for improvement opportunities. Being audit ready every day promotes better performance and safer food. Having these certifications is one way a company can demonstrate due diligence to food safety. All GFSI certifications require commitment from senior management. This is shown by providing resources, financial, qualified staff, and time, including senior management's time. Senior management is responsible for appointing a qualified food safety program manager who is given the authority to maintain the standard. A positive quality and food safety culture is required. An example of this is following GMP and hygiene practices. Open communication is important so that staff understand expectations, roles, and responsibilities. A realistic timeline is required when developing and implementing a GFSI standard, as these are more robust than your average food safety program. Another critical component is ongoing continuous improvement. KPI, KPIs or can, uh, key performance indicators. These are one way of measuring and demonstrating improvements, such as reducing number of customer complaints or the amount of rework and waste. Steps to becoming GFSI certified. Selecting a standard is usually based on your customer requirement. Become familiar with the standard by attending formal training or reading the standard and guidance documents. The scope of certification means choosing which products and processes are to be audited. Then comes the development and implementation of the food safety management system. This can be done internally or through the help of consultants. Pre-assessment audits are optional, but recommended as this is an opportunity to identify any gaps in, the meeting this, in meeting the standard requirements prior to your certification audit. Next, you need to register with a certification body. There are several certification bodies available. It would be beneficial to request to have a local auditor to reduce costs. In many cases, you must have three months of completed records. Schedule the audit with the certification body, be audited by the certification body, ensure staff are trained. Certain requirements require formal training such as HACCP and internal auditing. Depending on the resources, it can take anywhere from 12 to six months for full program implementation. The audit starts with an opening meeting followed by a review of the written program, employee practices and processes. During the closing meeting, the auditor will then identify non-conformances non and provide a tentative audit score and when to expect the final report. Review audit report and submit corrective actions. If corrective actions are accepted and closed out, the certificate is issued. 
your annual recertification audit will be announced or unannounced depending on your audit cycle. Our team of food safety specialists can provide assessments, including gap assessments and pre-audit assessments, coaching, assisting with food safety management systems, development and implementation, and training. We offer public training, uh, NSF accredited training, or Nova Scotia Fishing Sector Council, or we also offer customized in-house training specific to the client's needs. Currently, the Seafood Accelerator Program funding is available until March 2023. Uh, programs available are the Seafood Market Access Food Safety Program, and the second is uh, program development programs, which include technical obstacles and new product creator or development. You can follow these links on our Perennia website <clears throat> for more information. In this video, you will meet Greg Simpson, president of Mersey Seafoods Limited, sharing his certification experience. Mersey has just recently become BRCGS certified, having received an A grade. Um, one moment, please. Simpson, I'm president of Mersey Seafoods here in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. I've been asked to provide a, a few comments, uh, just outlining our experience with our uh, process to get uh, BRC GS certification with our brand new Scala plant here in, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, asked to comment on a few things, uh, why BRC, uh, the impact to us, and uh, a little bit about the process. I guess first I would say the, uh, the process was, was quite daunting from the start. Um, we uh, had a, a, a lot of work to do, a lot of documentation to do, and uh, we uh, quickly realized we needed some help, and that's where uh, Perennia came in and certainly uh, walked us through every step of the way and took a, a, a lot of uh, uncertainty away from our team and uh, made a big difference. And uh, that certainly paid off at the end when we went through the, the audit and uh, got our, um, our BRC certification without them. It, uh, I don't know if it would have happened, and if it did, it would have been a lot more frustrating. So with that, I simply say thank you to Perennia. The why and the impact kind of go together. Uh, when we built, uh, set out to build a, a world-class state-of-the-art scholar plant, uh, we wanted to be able to uh, then sell our products uh, to all markets around the world. We have a premium product, uh, wild-caught scallops that uh, you know, can demand a premium price. But we can't ac access all of those markets without uh, BRC certification. So that was a, a no-brainer from our perspective. Uh, certainly an investment of, of uh, effort and time, but uh, it's one that certainly made sense to us. And it's absolutely done that. Uh, now we can uh, process scallops for others that we couldn't do before. And we produce a product that's uh, uh, BRC certified and we can go anywhere in the world with it. Uh, certainly access markets we couldn't before. So that makes a, a big difference and it allows us to keep our plant running all year round with uh, employment for our team all year round. So we're uh, extremely proud of what we've done here. We're extremely proud of our BRC certification. And uh, I guess the other thing I'd say is the, the certification product process certainly challenged us and forced us to look at every aspect of our, uh, of our uh, plant and to be prepared for anything that came at us uh, as we uh, go through production. So. We uh, are now extremely confident and proud of this, as I said before, and uh, BRC is uh, not something we regret and have no second thoughts. With that, uh, I say thank you to Perennia and um, take care. Thank you so much, Pam. 
Next up, we have Denise Gershon, Global Aquaculture Association, who will give us an overview of the BAP certification process and its benefits. Denise is the Global Business Development Manager for Supply Chain, supply chain Engagement for Global Aquaculture Association. Denise manages five country coordinators in Southeast Asia and South Asia and is responsible for all North American facilities. Her previous experience includes over 18 years as seafood procurement manager in both corporate and private sectors. Highliner Foods from 2007 to 2019 and Stavis Seafoods from 2000 to 2006. She is a Bachelor of Science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Master of Science Fisheries and Allied Aquacultures from Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. Denise? Thank you, Fred. Can you see my screen? Can everyone? Thank you, Fred. Thank you for that introduction. Um, today, I'll be focusing on how the BAP program can help you meet your customer sustainability requirements, but more on that in a bit. First, I'd like to thank Tom and the Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I've been to Halifax and Lunenburg quite a few times, and I have to say you have a beautiful area to call your home. And I would like to thank you all um, for the Christmas tree that you send our way every year. Sorry about that. Some of you may be very familiar with the Global Aquaculture Association and the best aquaculture practices, but for those of you who are not, I'd like to introduce our organizations. The GAA strives to be the voice of the aquaculture industry. John had mentioned that the consumers are looking for education and the GAA strives to be that voice. Our outreach team does this through our films, our podcasts, online magazine, and social media. The BAP program is part of the GAA. We're the stewards of aquaculture. As you're aware, sustainable and healthy approaches to feeding the world's growing population are more critical than ever before. John mentioned during his presentation that consumers are looking for more healthy options and seafood is part of them. As wild fisheries have reached their capacity, aquaculture is needed for future generations to enjoy the seafood that we do today. And the BAP certifies that aquaculture is done, is raised sustainably or responsibly, I should say. Not only do the two organizations share an office in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, USA, but we share a vision that one, that the world embraces and engages the role of responsibly farmed seafood in meeting global nutritional needs. We offer a certification as well as membership. It's estimated by the FAO that by 2030, the seafood produced for human consumption will be made up of over 60% of aquaculture products. Today, it's a little bit over 50%. In addition, by 2050, the global demand for animal protein is expected to increase by 50%. To meet this, pro this protein demand, aquaculture, a sustainable resource and efficient protein will need to be a part of that equation. But I'm preaching to the choir with you all. BAP standards are benchmarked to international third-party organizations. GFSI, Global Food Safety Initiative, as Pam had mentioned, GSCP, Global Social Compliance Program, and GSSI, which is the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative. Being recognized by the gatekeepers of international certification standards is very important for the integrity of our program. Our standards are not simply written by our president, George Chamberlain, or our team um, drafting them and publishing them. The standards are reviewed annually. I often say trust, but verify. And you can trust what the GFSI, GSSI, and or the GSCP tells you about our program. A real life example is a retailer may mandate that your product be audited to GFSI benchmark standard rather than specifically naming which standard. Um, during the video um, that Pam had shown, they had shown a BRC um, 
certification that they had just gone through. Be aware that some of the certifications are specific only to food safety and or social accountability. The BAP program is the most comprehensive um, aquaculture certification covering all four pillars of responsibly raised seafood. BAP standards are written with four pillars in mind. Environmental, including water conservation, water quality, and effluence. Social accountability, ensuring human rights, labor laws um, are adhered to employee health and safety. Um, the third, food safety, and um, which is the assurance that no banned antibiotics or other chemicals are used and that all approved chemical treatments are carried out in a responsible fashion. And last but not least, animal health and welfare, best practices in health, um, husbandry. So as the demand for protein grows, more and more retailers and food service companies are demanding certifications. They only have so much bandwidth and time and resources for their buyers to visit facilities and they need assurances. I was a buyer for nearly 20 years. And when I started a copy of a um, facilities CASA plan was sufficient to um, issue a purchase order. But over time, the end customer wanted assurances. The globalization of trade, the internet and the sophistication of the consumer raised the bar for assurances. Aquaculture is a global industry. It's fragmented and relatively new. And we must be better than most because in today's world of sound bites and social media, one negative story can influence your customer for years. And John mentioned, you know, that education that needs to be done. My point in showing you this map is to demonstrate that this is not just in North American consumers that are requiring BAP certification, but in the EU, China, Japan, buyers are accepting and or requiring BAP certification. I came to the BAP two years ago, and at that time, I knew that a facility had to have a BAP certification to sell into such retailers as Walmart or Del Hayes, El Hall Del Hayes. I likened a certification to a driver's license. Not all licenses are the same. To drive an 18-wheeler from, from Canada to the US, a driver must hold a C, um, CDL, a commercial driver's license, and follow their company's protocols to drive them. Now, many retailers and food service companies may have different certification requirements, and it's important to understand your requirements. As Pam mentioned, ask questions. Um, typically, these requirements for certification are stated on your customer's website in their sustainability reports, or it may actually be written into the specifications. Talk with your customer. Next slide. Now, the growth of the BAP over the past 23 years has been incredible, and every year we work with continuous improvement in mind. For example, our standards, they're not static. We're currently on our fifth iteration of our seafood processing standard. They're reviewed, updated, benchmarked, et cetera. We have a program integrity team at the BAP whose role it is to ensure that third-party certification um, CBs, um, third-party certification bodies, I should say, CBs and auditors, as well as the BAP aquaculture facilities follow the program requirements. The BAP production chain, as shown here, start or ends, depending on how you look at it, with the processing plant or the producer. It moves back to the farm, the feed mill, and the hatchery, in which we have a chain of custody. Then the product ships to the distributor and or retailer food service and on to the end customer. This flow chart is, um, this flow is documented in our star, our star system. Each star on the BAP logo represents a different part of the aquaculture production chain. One star is the processing facility, two star, which has the four pillars that I had mentioned previously. Two star is the BAP processing plant and the farm. 
Um, three star is the, um, the plant, the farm, and or the hatchery and feed mill. And the fourth star is the plant, the farm, the hatchery and or feed mill um, to give you the four stars. Currently, that's the highest ranking that we have available today. And each is based on moving from the processing plant backwards into the supply chain. Soon our logo requirements will be updated, but I thought you might like to see how the logo would appear on a retail bag. Keep in mind for mussels and oysters, there is not a feed mill or a processing plant unless the product is frozen or value added, smoked and canned. But often the product um, for mussels and oysters is simply clean, grated and bagged. And as such, the star system would not be applicable. If you see here, this is what the logo would look like on a retail packaging for um, an oyster or farm mill. And the certification would say farm, um, it would, instead of a P number, it would have a um, F number for the farm. As mentioned earlier, our producers are provided resources. Um, some of the resources that we provide are a BAP spotlight story um, on our blog, some social media cross promotion, um, newsletter features and the like. Um, Aquademia is um, a podcast that we have on the GAA side and um, I just saw John smile. I don't know whether he's been a part of Aquademia or not, but um, I've had a great time with Sean, Justin, and Maddie talking about various species that I've had extensive experience um, with in the past. They have a fantastic way of engaging the audience while educating them at the same time. Their subjects vary from species-specific topics to cooking, as John had mentioned in his, that the consumer, the end consumer in the retail is really looking for those cooking tips. And they even include current events impacting the seafood um, supply chain, et cetera. Um, a simple Google search will help you find their podcast. And The Advocate, which is our online magazine, and it's edited by James Wright. He does a fantastic job of bringing together some of the latest scientific advancements from around the globe. Over the, first, um, the past year, he started tracking the time readers spend reading um, The Advocate and their locations. It's been incredible to see the audience, to see how the audience has expanded um, in North America and in India in particular. The other thing that we offer our producers is what we refer to as splash pages, and that will be coming soon. And that's when we link our website to your website. Um, so that a primary contact at your facility, um, such as a salesperson, would be able to interact. So if somebody wanted to see is somebody um, BAP um, certified, they'd go to our website, they'd see your facility, and they could click on it and get your contact information. Last, um, our invitation to the Goal Conference is something that we offer to our producers. Um, this year it will be held online um, due to COVID in April. Um, we had a online presence um, last year. We'll have an online presence this year. And also, fingers crossed, we have um, a scheduled Goal Conference for Seattle. So we hope to see you there. Um, and next year we'll be moving to Japan. So the strategic partnership is a membership category that's exclusively for associations such as the um, Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia. There's no commitment of funds, but really an exchange of mutually beneficial resources as determined by the partner in the GAA. And that's something that I'll talk with Tom and the others um, soon. So a few last points. Um, that I'd like to mention. The Global Aquaculture Alliance Farm Standard Issue 3.0 has been released and will become mandatory for the new and recertifying facilities June 15, 2021. Renamed BAP Farm Standard replaces the 2.4 of the Finfish Crustacean Farm Standard 
and now covers all eligible um, fed aquaculture species. The key changes in the farm standard um, 3.0 include a ban on antimicrobials designated as critically important for the human medicine by the WHO, which is the World Health Organization. Additional social accountability clauses related to equal, um, equality in worker safety, specific consideration for environmental requirements for reservoir lake-based um, lake cage farms, recirculating aquaculture systems, RAS, and coastal flow through um, farms, clarity on metrics such as bee conversion ratios, fish in fish out ratios, and effluent nutrient loads, additional wildlife proje um, protection clauses about acoustic deterrence, devices, entanglements, et cetera, and the scope of this new standard includes um, fed mollusks such as abalone, as well as sea cucumbers and other aquatic invertebrates when they're grown in land-based facilities. And my last point that I'd like to mention is that we're currently certifying plants to wild species. Seafood Processing Standard 5.1 now includes aquaculture and wild species. You get the same four pillar coverage and food safety um, GFSI benchmarked for wild species. We also own the certification for um, RFVS, which is our responsible fishing vessel standard. And there's currently multiple pilots occurring. The BAP program was not built overnight. In fact, it's been in um, development for over 20 years. But the, um, the best seafood practices program, which links plant vessels and certified fishery will take years to evolve as well. We'll take the learnings that we had on the aquaculture side and we're bringing them over to the wild. And why this is important in particular for facilities is there's facilities that actually have aquaculture species and wild species. There'll be a designation between the two in the facility, but a facility that is GFSI certified, the entire plant, whether they're processing on lines one, two, three, and four aquaculture species with a divider for the wild species. Um, so there's no cross contamination um, on lines five and six, that entire facility would be certified. So that's an important point. And Pam mentioned um, in terms of um, trying to bring down costs and the like in terms of, you know, your auditing and knowing what your customer needs really ask a lot of questions and find out what particular certification is best for your for their needs as well as yours. I want to thank you for your time. I've included a couple of additional slides that you may review at your leisure. I will make this um, PowerPoint available. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly with any questions. Stay safe and we look forward to meeting you in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. There is a question for you in the chat room and maybe we can uh, save that for the end to address. And last but certainly not least, we have Jennifer Wiper from Cook Aquaculture, who is going to speak to some of the benefits of BAP certification. Jennifer has nearly 20 years experience in the salmon aquaculture industry, currently employed as manager compliance and certification for Cook Aquaculture based out of Blacks Harbor, New Brunswick. A BSc and aquaculture graduate of the Nova Scotia Agricultural College, now Dalhousie University Faculty of Agriculture in Truro, and a born, born and raised Newfoundlander, she is passionate about farming and its role in meeting global food demand while ensuring that it is done sustainably. Her education led her to a career in the British Columbia salmon farming industry in 2002, where she began work with certification programs. Today, her experience with Cook has broadened the scope of certifications to include the best aquaculture practices standards across the full integrated operations of the global seafood company, among other certifications and recommendation programs such as BRCGS, Food Safety, Marine Stewardship Council, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, and Oceanwise Seafood, to name a few. Outside of her work with certification programs, Jennifer is a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for Merck Animal Health Aqua Care 365 program and is a board member of the Aquaculture Association of Canada, currently serving as a president-elect. 
with wide ranging experiences in the industry from site worker to fish health to production planning and certification. Jennifer has a broad perspective on and understanding of the industry. She challenges the industry to do it and do it right. She believes in the industry. She believes the industry has a story to tell, one of trial and error, but also of great accomplishments and undeniable potential. Jennifer. Thank you, Fred. Um, Denise, I think I may need you to stop sharing your yes. screen. I think that worked. Okay, is the presentation up? Okay, good. So hi everyone, thanks for sticking around. Um, I, I saw a meme the other day and it made me think about all these virtual conferences that we're all attending. And it was just basically a short quote and it was a person going around with, you know, one of those little canvas bags that we all get at conferences. And they're like, I love these Zoom meetings and conferences, but I just wanna to go to a real one and get a cheap pen. <laughs> and I was like, my cheap pen stash is severely depleted. So I really hope that sooner rather than later we can get together and have these types of uh, conferences in person but um, until we can I think this is a great solution. So um, as, as uh, kind of graciously introduced me there and, and Denise just talked about um, my name is Jennifer Wiper I'm the manager of compliance and certification for Cook Aquaculture North America. Um, sorry, I was trying to move Fred's, that's the worst thing about these, uh, these slideshows, all the little windows that pop up. Uh, I've been working with the company since May 2010, and certifications have been the focus of my career for over a decade. Um, through that time, I supported and managed various certification programs, and today I wanted to focus on the North American aquaculture operations, um, Eastern Canada, and the state of Maine, state of Maine obviously, for um, Cook. I just wanted to give a little introduction on the Cook Global family. Uh, so the company has grown from a single salmon farm in New Brunswick in 1985 to a seafood leader with operations around the globe in both farmed and wild fisheries. In terms of Nova Scotia, family owned Cook Aquaculture under the operational division of Kelly Cove Salmon Limited has been operating marine farms in the province for over 23 years. Our aim is to grow responsibly in Nova Scotia, doing so with fish health and environmental sustainability sustainability at the forefront of our growth strategy. And now a little introduction on Cook Aquaculture's history of certifications. So this chart represents a timeline of our various certifications since the beginning of third party audits. The numbers represent a division, farm, hatchery, feed mill, processor or distributor in no particular order. So in 2007, we first delved into third party certification to be able to sell eggs into Ireland. This evolved into certification at all of our hatcheries, sea sites and processing plants, which was a first, which was a first in the industry in North America, certification to a salmon specific standard. In 2010, to meet customer demands, we began to certify our processing facilities to BRC, now BRCGS. In 2013, again, to meet the needs of our customers and shifting markets, we switched from our then current certification CQS to BAP. In 2016, we started the transition from individual farm and hatchery audits into the BAP group program. Um, so just a little background on group, I didn't include it in my slide, but um, I wasn't sure if Denise was going to chat about it, but group program allows you to apply for a large group of farms or hatcheries and you are required to have an internal management system. And as part of that internal management system, you have to um, be doing your own internal audits. And the results of those internal audits are then shared with the external auditor prior to the external audit. And they use a risk assessment to determine which facilities will actually be picked um, for audit. This is, um, and it, it kind of ties right into this to this slide is, is the benefits um, of certification period is that it includes, um, allows for consistency in and across operations while also providing uh, consumer recognition as trust and 
and trust as has, has been previously talked about, as well as market access and co-branding opportunities. Um, the group program has an additional feature of allowing inclusion of all life stages of fish. Uh, so this guarantees that star status at any time. Um, so if we happen to jump into a farm early or um, we needed to move some fish um, to the market, maybe at a different size, um, we don't have to worry about trying to get an auditor in at that last minute. We just put all of our swimming inventory into the group and that way we can harvest um, at any time and be assured that we can market our fish to the highest standards. The group also allows um, lots of additional time for making improvements to your systems, um, being proactive versus reactive. Um, so a lot of times we get, um, if you spend all your time doing audits and all that time prepping up for a single firm and then actually doing the audit and then addressing any corrective actions, you actually burn up a lot of your time. But if you can put all your farms and all your eggs into one basket, let's say, um, you, you spend a longer time doing the actual audit, but you have so much more time in the end to be working on just improving your systems. Um, sorry, I think I, now I'm lost on my slides. Um, I hate these things, these previews. Um, so are there, there are challenges to certification. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, the changing criteria. So Denise just mentioned there's a new feed standard um, coming out. So the changes in criteria and standards mean, mean that producers must act quickly. Uh, this can also um, create confusion uh, because you have to get interpretation. You have to try to understand what that new change is actually requesting of you. You. Um, evolving regulations can sometimes cause conflicts between regulatory requirements and certification standards. And a lot of times that can be addressed by um, just simply um, talking it out with the, with the certification body and uh, perhaps getting a variance to that standard because your restrictions on regulatory requirements. Um, lack of qualified auditors because of the requirements for previous knowledge and experience. Um, then there's also the auditor training and upkeep that they must do. Um, there's a lifestyle appeal or lack thereof. And uh, then when you finally get yourself to a, an auditor that you're you know, comfortable with, well, you know, three times the charm and they're gone and you have to get somebody new. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, the interpretation differences. So there's you trying to interpret the standard. There's somebody else trying to interpret the standard and the two of you trying to work to, through it together. And then there are changing market demands. So it went through kind of the benefits of certification. Um, so it's kind of tying it back to the, um, the challenges, it's not easy. Um, it takes work. And so kind of what this chart represents is um, it's our external audits um, and standards and number of sites. So, you know, taking it all and adding it all together, what it roughly translates into is nearly 900 externally certified sites since 2007 across 12 different standards. Um, with hard work, though, comes success. Um, so Cook Aquaculture has the most certified sites in the BAP program of any salmon producer. We're one of two worldwide salmon producers that directly own and have certified um, all the project certified the full production chain for all four stars. We're currently the only salmon company in the world to have both salmon or sorry, marine farm and hatchery groups in the BAP group program. Uh, and our Kind of statistics to date is that we have two primary plants, four value added, one feed mill, 16 hatcheries, and 66 sea sites um, currently certified to BAP in North America, uh, which again translates since 2013 with the BA program, approximately 500 certified facilities um, to BAP's running total. And that's kind of our um, history with BAP. Yeah, I just got to figure out how to get back to you guys. We'd like to thank Cook for the support.
Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we do have so a few questions in here. There's been a lot of um, interest in getting the PowerPoint slides um, access to everyone. I think we'll, we'll we'll talk about that offline, perhaps, and maybe put them up on the Perennial website or something like that. Or if there's a way to, we can link it to this presentation. I know John's is up there now, so if there's a way to do that, we will uh, we will do our best. Um, so we do have a question for Denise, and let me find it. Um, to Denise, do you think that consumers will start to look for the BAP stamp soon? Does this require consumer education? By the way, you're welcome for the Christmas tree. And, <laughs> and if I could add that, I guess, you know, what, what is being done to educate the consumer on what that stamp means for them? And, you know, is there more needed? And um, yeah. That's one thing that I'm really proud of, um, that the BAP is unique in that we're a nonprofit that does have the GAA, the Global Aquaculture Alliance, as an education arm. Um, and so there is a tremendous amount of art outreach that we do. Um, we monitor social media quite a bit. For every negative story, we have to do like 10 to, um, to kind of get the science out there. And we are science-based and I think that's really important. We are um, taking in the best of science and trying to get that information into the right hands. And as I had mentioned, that's through the ad, um, the podcasts, our films, um, our online marketing, um, online magazine, and also to, to your point, getting that logo on packaging because a lot of times um, retailers will say that in their specifications that the product has to be certified um, to BAP and or to a GFSI equivalent um, and um, trying to get that logo on the retailer's product can be difficult. That's really what we want. We want people to recognize the logo. Um, and we're, you'll see it more and more, I think. Um, once you start to kind of key into it, you start to see it a lot more. So, and ask for it, you know, tell, tell, your, tell your retailers, tell everyone that, you know, I'd like to buy BAP product, where can I find it? Great, thank you. I think this is a question for anyone. Is, are there any support or funding for startups to apply to certifications that are needed? Anyone aware of any funding available for, for that? I'm not aware of funding per se, but we do have a small program, the, an IBAP program that kind of walks um, people that may not be doing the volume that they can afford full certification that they need to walk before they can run. Um, and they can contact me and I can put them in touch with the right people so that they can at least start to kind of gain that momentum. Um, certification can be overwhelming. It's a lot of documentation. I mean, Jen knows, Jen lives it. I mean, it's a lot to do. Um, and we try to make it as fair and reasonable as we can. Um, so um, please just reach out to me directly. I gave you my email and I can get you in touch with the right people here. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question for John, actually. Are you seeing market demand and or market access requirements for certification increasing, for certifications increasing, and how will that impact Nova Scotia seafood companies? Oh, that, that brings up an interesting point because when we look at the experience during the pandemic, one of the things the retailers said was that they got a lot less questions about certification sustainability. So for example, uh, Publix, which used to get uh, pre-pandemic, they would get uh, a certain number of questions per year through their consumer hotlines and so forth. Uh, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 per month or something. And some of these were like questioning the safety of farm seafood or farm versus wild. Others were questions about sourcing and so forth. Uh, but during the pandemic, they got none. And, and they really, uh, they really felt that, uh, sorry for the interruption, but they really felt that <laughs> that the uptake on farm seafood, people weren't questioning it in the same way that they were uh, prior to the pandemic. And they, they pointed that out as something of interest. And the, the buyer for Publix also said that the 
uh, sort of overview was much more focused on getting supply rather than sustainability. Uh, so can I add to that though? Sure. Um, I would like to say that, um, the, you know, there's a counter to every story and it was something that I was keenly aware of because I mean, I'm the one who does the shopping in my home and it was the type of thing that I would either go online or and or be in the grocery store and just whipping through that grocery store as quickly as I could. But one thing that we have seen is that um, I keep going back to the same two, but they're just top of mind is Ajo Del Hayes has really stepped up and issued what they would like for sustainability um, and a renewed um, focus on it and um, you know, stop and shop and the like are part of that. The other one is Walmart. I mean, Walmart's going from not just wanting to be sustainable, but they came out um, quite clearly and said they wanna be regenerative. So you're gonna see more and more coming on from cl a climate change standpoint, um, and you'll see more from a food safety standpoint. I think you'll see more and more um, facilities looking for the certification just in terms of the food safety. Um, Denise, I just want to add one thing about this. this the retailers were committed. I mean, there, there was no oh, yeah. wavering whatsoever in the industry and retailer commitment to sustainability. The only thing that, that these uh, buyers were saying was that in the pandemic shopping, they saw a decrease in, in customer interaction uh, around that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this may be for you as well, Denise, we'll see. A few years ago, there was some discussion across auditing standards, BAP, MSC, BRC, et cetera, to see if there were efficiencies to be gained. At the time, the opportunity seemed to be focused on the boilerplate company info and the foundational traceability verification. Unfortunately, it didn't get far. What could we collectively, collectively do as an industry or with support of associations to alleviate the repetitive burden of auditing? This could be for anyone, I guess. <laughs> do you want to start, Denise? I agree. People have audit fatigue. I mean, it's the type of thing, not only, and Jen, you can nod, it's a lot, you know? I mean, it's the type of thing that from, um, you have to do so many different things for each different customer, and it can be a lot um, in terms of one will want an MSC, one will want a, well, there's not necessarily, we don't, we may certify above the water. Um, that's one way to looking at it um, on the wild side now, so that um, we will get you to the fishery, which is below the water, which is will link you to an MSC um, fishery. But the fact remains is that there is audit fatigue. We're doing our best to kind of work in tandem with different um, aquaculture sch or certification schemes so that we're not overlapping and you're not having that repetitive um, one customer wants one, one customer wants another, and you spend your entire day just gathering documents rather than actually focusing on um, what you need to be focusing on, which is, you know, food safety, social compliance, and the like. Yeah, um, just to kind of follow up with that, is the person being audited? Yes, there's audit fatigue, um, but um, there are there are, and I think, sorry, I think your name was Catherine who brought it up. Yes. Um, there was some benchmarking done a couple of years back between some of the, the larger standards. So ASC, BAP and global gap and across some of the species, there was some benchmarking done that essentially said, if you did a BAP audit for say shrimp, then that counted as um, you know, you could also get global gap certification and that that talk seemed to die out. Um, but all of the standards, I shouldn't say all but a good portion of the standards are working towards these kind of group programs. And the group programs or the cluster programs, um, multi site programs, those are the ones that are really helping reduce the audit burden. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when it comes down to it, there are certain retailers um, that 
have a comfort level with a certain standard. So even though, you know, you might have three or four standards all benchmarked to that same scheme, they have, they have a comfort level or an association with a certain standard. And so they might say, well, you can do any GFSI benchmark standard, but no, really, we want you to do this one. And the guy next door has a different opinion. Um, so all you can do is try to choose your standards wisely um, what's going to fit um, the largest portion of your market and which ones have very similar um, requirements should you need to have more than one. Um, we've been gracious a couple times to actually have an auditor who was trained in BRCGS and BAP um, and he was able to conduct the two audits simultaneously, not, not that one replaced the other, but, and we had to pay for both audits, um, but he was able to, to answer say the you know, 300 questions and then tack on 50 more. Um, and we were able to get those, those two audits done. So yeah, I, I would think you just look at your market and, and see what, what's gonna work best for you. Great, thank you. Uh, we were Getting close to the end here. I'm just wondering, John, if you could talk a little bit about the impact of the shift from food service to retail on the processor in general. Obviously, they would have had to make some changes to their output into their plants and things like that. Do you, do you have any any thoughts on on what what they would have went through in order to make that shift or that pivot from food service to retail? Well, the the biggest issue, I mean, from a processor side is there's been a tremendous increase in cost and operations as people have had to reconfigure lines for, for safety and, and to protect, protect people. So whether that is changing the, the uh, um, you know, number of people in the plant at a given time, spacing out workstations, putting up protective equipment, uh, changing uh, you know, the various uh, product flow, that, that's been the biggest issue. And in terms of uh, Atlantic Canada, uh, labor issues. I mean, we've seen this huge decrease in labor mobility and that is uh, causing people to really have to look at labor saving uh, things wherever they can. And it's also affected uh, in Alaska right now, we have a lot of plant shutdowns uh, due to uh, COVID infections. And that's going to, um, have an impact on the availability of, of uh, pollock fillets, for example, uh, later this spring. So I think from the processor point of view, it's not been so much the shift from food service to retail. It's been a, a huge shift in how production can take place uh, in this current environment. And on the retail food service shift, I think most of that's come into packaging uh, because what happens is the two different channels take different types of packaging. And you can't, as somebody said earlier with the cruise ships, you can't just take uh, lobster tails that you've sent to a cruise ship and put it into a retail store. They're not in the right consumer product, facing products or wrappers. They don't have labels. They don't have the net weights. They don't have all the things that are requirements for retail. So uh, those are the two areas, uh, change in production plans and, and packaging, where I think there's been the greatest impact. Great, thank you. I do have a note from our from our tech support on the PowerPoint slides, and we will they will be added to the uh, Perennia website in about a week's time. So if you want to check back then, um, we'll be able you'll be able to download them at that time. So it looks like we're out of questions. So this concludes our session for today. I'd like to thank uh, John. Fred, Sorry, Fred, you yes. do have one question in the chat oh. about BRC being mandatory and oh. selling into the EU. Uh, I did. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry. Thank you, John. It says, yeah, BRC is mandatory if selling to, into EU retail change. Is it not? I guess that's the question. Is it not mandatory for retail chains? I can take that. Sure. Um, thank you. Actually, it's, I don't think that it's mandatory. It's just that it's much more recognized. So um, there are, you know, the other standards are all equal, but we have found with our clients that their customers are the ones driving the BRCGS because it originated from 
you know, written. So um, that's what we've found. But um, as far as mandatory, um, I think it all depends on who your client is and their customer. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that does it conclude our session for today. Not that I want to rush, but it is getting to two o'clock. So I know everyone probably has to get back to work. So I do want to thank John, Pam, Denise, and Jennifer for their engaging presentations this afternoon. And thanks to all of you out there for joining us today. And I do invite you all to uh, participate in the upcoming digital sessions as part of this series. Have a great rest of the afternoon. <laughs>